Darshan and today we have a special guest. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Tony Thomas, the former Chief Information Officer of Nissan Motors. Mr. Tony Thomas is well known for his strategic leadership and creative ideas. During his time at Nissan, he used technology to make the business more efficient and to improve the customer experience. He also helped make the teams work together better and he encouraged innovation. Today, we can know more about Mr. Tony Thomas' accomplishments, his experience and his thoughts on digital transformation. So, let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Tony Thomas. As we know that uh, he is one of the selected Indian CIOs uh, who assumes uh, globally and uh, with the global responsibilities. So, welcome you sir. Thank you. As we know that, uh, so the metros in US started a century back. And it started very lately in India. So you think that the new innovations will take plenty of time to come to India? Yeah, so thank you, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for the question. Hello everybody. Uh, see, when we really look at uh, what what happened in the US or quote unquote the developing nations uh, and where we are today as India, we really have to probably go back and look at what drives this development. So in the old days, you know, it was all about uh, agriculture based economy, right? The agrarian economy. So in agrarian economy, uh, what we did was uh, we formed civilizations around sources of water. So where we had big rivers in the valley, in Nile, in all these uh, different uh, rivers, you know, we formed civilizations. But over a hundred years ago, when, they, when the industrial revolution started. Uh, the whole uh, metros or the business population started congregating towards places of manufacture because that is how the supply chain evolved. Uh, so, for example, if you look at uh, something as simple as uh, meat processing, uh, you know, it's about you know how you transport the uh, cattle, you know, how you how you uh, slaughter it, how you process the meat, uh, the tanneries around. Uh, leather manufacturing, you know, all these things, right? So all these industries. So if you take, for example, automotive, the same way, right? Once you manufacture a car, all the uh, parts and mechanics uh, around that, uh, how you move the cars, right? So which means it has to be accessible to the port for transportation facilities, etc. So, so this is how the old economy uh, operated, the industrial economy operated. But now that we are in the digital economy, digital economy is driven and powered through data. Which means you really don't need to have a very specific location where the growth can happen. So, for example, in India, uh, we can operate effectively and seamlessly in Delhi as in Trivandrum or Kochi as well, or in Calcutta or in Kotlin, uh, for that matter. Because all that takes is connectivity, access to talent, and to be able to solve uh, problems. So, in that sense, in the old days, when you had a factory, when you had an automotive factory, for example, you needed to have people in the factory working next to the machines because the controls of the machines were physically attached to the machine. So you had to operate the lever or you have to do the control right on the machine. Today, it's all remote control. So you can have a factory in any part of the world, South Africa, for example, Cape Town, and it can be controlled from here, right here in this office because you really don't need to be next to the machine. So when you, when you think in that terms, then any advancements in any technology, any industry can reach any parts of the world. One. Two, while we missed out on certain developments in the past as, 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 as India, for example, you know, the land telecom line is something that we really did not have the penetration like in the developed nations. So what did we do? We jumped mostly from known telephone to mobile telephone. So you skip one generation, right? Which means that you're not really sequentially grow. You can actually jump and then you can grow, right? So you really, when it comes to telecom, for example, we didn't do so much. We are probably in the forefront as much as any other nation in the world. We are probably the lowest cost um, data provider uh, telecom services in the world right now, right? So in that sense, when you really look at it, I don't really believe that there is any handicap India has because that the so-called developing nations started in the industry journey about 100 years ago. Uh, you 
said that no, it will not take more time to reach the new technologies or new innovations to come to India. That's uh, that's good to hear that. Sir. Thank you. So, what are the current technology trends prevailing in the world today, and how it is benefit to the society at large? Yeah, um, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, like I said earlier, um, today we are in the digital economy. Digital economy is fueled power through data. So a lot of the exponential technologies and new emerging technologies, the the big impact technologies are about data. So first and foremost, how do we capture data? So in the consumer world, you know we had one machine, one phone, which interacted to the net, etc. But in today's world, we have IoT powered machines, devices. Um, so we have billions and billions of machines that are now connected, which makes decisions, um, which work uh, in tandem uh, to drive the decision making across. So 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 IoT capture, the data capture is a big big aspect of this. Machines are now uh, sold with sensors in it that can sense and capture data. So that's part one, right? How do we capture the data? The second part is how do we move the data? So while IoT technologies, the industry digital in all these things are enhancing, it's also about how do you transport the data from point A to point B. So now we are talking about five uh, 5G technically can be about 100 times or more faster than 4G. Even in India, I think in today's testing, we are about 15 plus times faster than a 4G. So now it gives you much more power. In the old days, when we when we started programming, I started programming in mainframes and IBM, uh, IBM mainframes. Uh, you know, you know, we had to be very cautious about the amount of data we store uh, because the machine didn't have the storage capacity. Or even the processing power, for that example. Uh, whereas in today's world in 5G, you can capture, you know, because we have the 5G, you can capture all the data in IoT, whatever data you want. Because now we are talking about millions and uh, uh, trillions of uh, you know, megabytes of data that we capture. Right? So then, how do you transport that to the next level? Now, 5G allows you to do that. Then, the third aspect of the um, new technology is about how do you store and how do you compute. Um, so that is where we talk about, for example, you know, we all know about cloud. We now talk about edge-based computing, so which means that you know we really need to put everything in the cloud. We can have some portions of it in the edge. We also talk about quantum computing, right? So you know, massive ways of uh, computing, um, which is very different than the traditional ways of bits and bytes uh, type of computing that we had in the past. The fourth angle about the, the, the technology goes about how do we analyze. The data that we take. Um, so we talk about AI, ML, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, etc. So decision making. We used to program computers in the past to do a certain activity. Um, so it will based on a decision tree. When it meets a point, it makes a decision. Should I do this? Should I do that? But it's all programmed, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a black and white decision. Whereas in today's world, we program the machines to think. So the machines can now learn. So it can self-learn, it can understand the logic behind a decision that is being made and then it can make that decision itself. Right? So, so that is becoming very powerful. Then the next, next aspect is about how do we produce, how do we create. 3D printing is a major growth uh, area right now that is happening. Uh, you know, previously manufacturing happened only in the factories. Today manufacturing can happen. Any manufacturing can happen in any part of the world. So how do we how do we then capitalize on that? So you could have a spare part of a critical machine that can be printed right there next to a remote location where the machine is. Or healthcare, uh, we can even print uh, body parts, right? Sure. right? So it's, so all these things are really getting to the point that uh, you know technology is completely changing the way we do. Lastly, it's about how do we experience. So we talk about augmented reality, virtual reality, etc. So we are not now just not seeing things in 2D or 3D. We are now actually starting to see things in a very different augmented world where now I can make decisions much more smarter and faster. Um, so, so, so all in all, when you really think about it, all these technologies are making massive changes in the way we do things. And, and a lot of it we don't even realize. A lot of us, a lot of people walk around with smart watches, uh, which has you know sensors programmed in it that can now detect your body 
uh, functioning at any given point of time, intervene proactively if it is required, etc. But all these things are happening, uh, for example, because of some of these uh, technologies that we talked about. It also opens up a lot, lot of job opportunities, you know, now talking about an ICT Academy uh, skill development uh, context. This also opens up a lot of job opportunities for our youngsters. Uh, not just in the areas that I mentioned, but even in the adjacent areas, like for example, uh, cyber security, digital trust, uh, in all these aspects, right, even beyond, in as a service uh, uh, mode, uh, jobs, right, quite a bit of uh, opportunities that are open. Thanks, it was quite interesting that you are responding about that uh, 5G thing. 5G, that means, uh, as we know that, it's already 5G introduced a couple of years back, um, globally, uh, but right now we are it's with the North Direct scheme to India and uh, the second, I think that uh, the next generation, the 6G also, the research has been started and as you said that, that 3D printing, uh, as you know, uh, you said that, uh, okay, right now the post parts can also be the different and an emerging technology is coming in the 3D printer. Thank you, sir. It was uh, quite informative. Education and skilling should go hand in hand or even merge. So the country like India, how is it possible to implement that? So, it's quite an interesting question that you talk about. Right? Um, sometimes we mistake uh, education for skill. Uh, you're right, I mean, education and skilling has to go hand in hand together. Uh, but unfortunately, many times we focus on the education part of it and not on the skill part of uh, development. Uh, so, for example, now we are speaking a language. I can teach somebody the alphabets. I can give a dictionary to somebody and make them learn all the words in English. But the construct of that sentence, how do you, pre, how do you construct a sentence, how do you have a conversation, that's a skill that we have to develop. And that skill comes from practice, that skill comes from understanding the problem, that skill under, comes from knowing that you have to do something with the knowledge, the education that you have. Uh, so in India, uh, especially, and I, stay, and I did my uh, schooling, uh, primary schooling outside of India, and I came back to Kerala to do my engineering. What I found here very interesting was that uh, the focus was more about learning something, it was not about applying something. Uh, so for me, the big gap that I find here today is that we are not focused on vocation-based skill training. It has to be that there has to be a purpose for education. Education is not for a degree. Uh, any degree is just an entry point into a particular job, but it's not really guaranteeing success when it comes to how to do your job. Um, so education and skill has to go hand in hand. Now, that has to happen right from the very young age. Right from primary school all the way through to degree, postgraduate uh, degrees, and continuing education, or even uh, you know upskilling uh, during uh, the jobs, uh, job or whatever you're doing at that point of time. Right, because learning is constant. Learning is not a uh, time-bound, school-bound, college-bound mechanism. So in that sense, yes, India has a lot of limitations, but India also has a lot of advantages. Because we are a very diverse population, we also have many different types of industries, many different types of businesses, many different types of problems that we can solve. So instead of learning something, being academic about it, if we start thinking about solving problems and using every knowledge that we have as a tool to solve a problem, just by learning how to use a hammer does not make you a carpenter. Right? Hammer is just a tool, a saw is just a tool. Right? So how do we translate that into, okay, now I need to solve a problem, which is, okay, I need a place to sit, I need something to sit on, or I need a table, uh, or I need something that so I can write on. Right? So, so these kind of things all of a sudden now becomes, how do I translate my education into skill? So that is a way of thinking. It is not a, it's not just something that, uh, will come automatically just by learning something, right? So, so that's where I'm saying, you know, these two has to go hand in hand. And, and it's, it's, it's not just about teaching people something, it's about making them apply something. Uh, again, I'll come back, I'll give an example of um, something that I personally experienced. When we did uh, uh, our orders, which is uh, 
tenth equivalent year. Um, we had to study, um, you know, just like everybody else, you know, density, uh, convection, current, convection currents, and you know, all these uh, beautiful things. But the questions, exam questions are never directly about talking about the density of air or anything like that. Right? The question tended to be very much more practical. Um, so I remember one of the questions that we had. So one question was about, and I'm talking about many years ago, why do your refrigerators have the freezer up at the top and not at the bottom of the refrigerator? Uh, well, that makes you think, because it's now in your book, textbook doesn't have that particular thing. Right? So now you have to start thinking, and you don't even know which chapter, uh, which topic this is dealing with. So now we start thinking about okay, so why do we have the refrigerator up at the top? Why can't we, sorry, the freezer up at the top, not at the bottom? Then you start thinking, no, you know why? Because that is the uh, coldest part of the of the refrigerator. So when it is cold, what happens? The air becomes colder. When air becomes colder, what happens? It becomes more dense, so it moves downwards, right? As it moves downwards, it becomes warmer. So what happens? Then that warm air moves up, right? So all of a sudden, a natural Convection is happening within the refrigerator, so airflow is happening. If you get the refrigerator at the bottom of the fridge, the old days, the today's fridge, fridge refrigerator has much more uh, uh, mechanical and it has much more capabilities, and you can even have the refrigerator freezer at the bottom. But in those days, right, it was a mechanical convection that it actually created. So if the freezer was up at the, uh, down at the bottom, then the cold air will always sit at the bottom, right? In, in Kerala, most of the houses are ventilators. Right, if you really don't have an air-conditioned house, right, the room has ventilators and all the ventilators are up at the top of the room, right, not at the bottom. Why? Because hot air is always at the ceiling side, right, so, so, so the hot air will always go out through, through that area, right. So, that's, so these are things that, you know, you apply based on your experiences, your academic knowledge, your skills, you, 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 the way you think. So to me, what we really lack today is that augmentation of application of knowledge slash education which then translate into skills that can be applied to solve real day-to-day -day problems. Yeah, thank you sir, you have a well explained that uh, with the uh, well, diversity of countries, diversity of limitation, how to overcome and uh, how to implement this uh, skilling and the education uh, like most or uh, how to uh, implement or how to apply all those uh, learning what we have done and as you said that uh, uh, the practical knowledge from the learning how we can implement into the practical side of our li uh, lives like into the job life so thank you sir you have well explained that how to implement uh, the education and the skilling into our daily life so that was a well explanation and uh, it's a knowledge sharing so and I just want to ask you that so do you think that the education will have to change its way uh, being leveraged uh, as for the new MEP 2020. Yeah, so our education system definitely needs an overhaul. Like I said, it's not just about learning something. Uh, it's about how we apply, how we solve problems, and the learning has to be lifelong. It's not the only time activity that we need to do. Uh, the sustainability development goals of uh, United Nations, I think Chapter 4, also talks about uh, education, universal education, accessible education, a lot of these things uh, are something that every country uh, that should follow. And India is, is, is a journey uh, to that SDG as well. Uh, so when you really look at it, uh, you know, NEP in that sense, NEP 2020 in that sense, uh, he is pushing us towards more of educating, building the base. Uh, and, 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 and then driving towards more or, more or less a lifelong education, more little more a practical oriented way of learning rather than uh, uh, bookish knowledge, if I may. Uh, so a lot of these things really have to uh, make a difference, right? Again, coming back to the examples that that I can see, and you know, I've seen my my you know, a lot of kids that I've known in the past, you know, who learn things by heart. That's how we are taught. That's how, you know, kids in Kerala learn, which is, you know, what we learn a formula by heart. Uh, like I said, I studied abroad, so I didn't have to, we were never taught how to learn anything by heart. So I cannot do, even today, remember a formula. But I, but I, but I know the theorem behind it. 
and they can derive a formula, and then from that formula I can get the answer. So even when I came uh, for engineering for engineering here, uh, you know, math was a paper that you know people would write only a few pages, right? Because when you have a formula, you just apply the number and they get the answer. But for me, that was the longest time, and I used to get papers after papers because I had to derive the formula uh, because I couldn't remember the formula by heart. Uh, so that's how we studied, which also means that whatever fundamentals you have, you remember that. Uh, so, so it's not just about repeating something, it is about knowing something, it's about applying something. So in that sense, the education policy has to absolutely change towards making kids understand something, imbibe the essence of what is being taught, and then apply it appropriately as is required. Uh, versus learning something by heart and then repeating it for exams. And our, and even our examination, ways of examination is something that encourages kids to study by heart. And I was talking to somebody a few days ago and they said, you know what, in higher education at least, we should stop with cross books. We should actually have open book exams. Because when you have open book exams, then you're not really worried about learning something by heart. Now you're thinking about, okay, what is being taught, where is it in the book, when a question comes in, it doesn't have to be a black and white question, it can be something that makes kids think. Then they can refer to that part of the book and then answer that. Again, going back to my engineering example, we used to learn syntax by heart of a program language. I mean, how ridiculous is that, right? I mean, syntax I can always read a better or I can compile it and I know when I, when I made a mistake in my, in, in, in my, in, in my syntax. So these, and, and learning syntax is really not going to help us, right? Because, you know, the, the, the programming languages keep changing, uh, keep improving um, uh, pretty much every year, right? So, so learning a syntax or something is really not going to help me anyway in my future. So these are things that I really believe that we need to break up on and we need to change and, and help kids learn instead of remember something. And I think anything helps that. Yeah, that is uh, actually you have well explained the flows of our education system earlier. What we have done, that it's, it's, yeah, in some ways, uh, when we look into it, it's really truly. <laughs> I think that as you said, that is very good. It's like a like a ridiculous as you said. So, and I just want to ask you, sir, as you asked earlier. So, do you think uh, that upskilling and cross-skilling will augment the skill set of the existing employees in the organization? So, well, so what is your opinion on that? Yeah, so again it goes back to you know, a lot of the things that we already spoke about. When you hire an employee, you are not usually hiring that employee for what that person knows at that point of time. Because many of the times what you learn in school, what you learn in college, and what you apply at work is very different. What you are learning in your education gives you is the foundation to learn the business, the business problems, and the way we solve that problem. So in that sense, pretty much anybody who comes into any company at any given point of time, as a fresher, as a first job, really doesn't matter which college or university the student went to, they are all almost starting at the same baseline of zero. And then from that point on, it is about how good you are as an employee, as a learner, to understand the company's business processes, how the company makes money, how the company solves problems, what are the products, how we build the products, how we sell the products, how we improve the products, etc. Now remember these products are not static either. This, the way we operate these products, which means the way we make, we sell, we design, none of these things are static. They keep changing year over year because the ecosystem is changing, the technologies are changing, the opportunities are changing. So then, what you learned 10 years ago in a company is probably not, not even relevant at this point of time in today's, today's world. You know, even you know, if you just look back, you know, we personally know how much, how many generations the technology has gone through in the last 25 years or so. So, a person, let's assume that starts a job at the age of 25, by the time he is 50 or she is 50, Whatever they have learned, whatever they are applied, whatever they came into start doing is probably obsolete by them. So, the key is constant learning, upskilling. It's not just about what degree we accumulated, it's not about what we knew before we came in, it is about what we learn in our jobs on a daily basis. 
and but the fundamentals will always remain the same. Uh, the fundamentals don't change much because you know it's commerce oriented, it is product development driven, it is supply chain managed. Uh, so it's so the fundamentals don't really change, but how we operate within that fundamentals, the constructs within that, the mechanics within that keep changing, and then we have to constantly adapt. We talked about programming a few minutes ago. The way we used to program 30 years ago is completely different than the way we program today. Those days, you know, we had to write every line of code, we have to save every bits and bytes. Uh, there was no real graphics at that point of time. Uh, you know, we mostly used to operate on the, uh, the green screen of IBM. Um, but, 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 but all these things now start changing. Uh, now you can do many things. You don't even need to learn a programming language to, to be one of the best programmers. Uh, probably the best programmers that are there right now don't even have a computer, computer, computer engineering degree, right? They learned it by themselves. Even some of these are school students uh, that learned these programming languages themselves, right? the programming capabilities themselves. So, so the same thing applies at work also. At work, you learn some things, but then many times you keep on learning. But even beyond, you keep on inventing, right? Sometimes you are the ones who actually not just learn what others have done, but create new ways of doing things so that others learn from what you invented, right? So that's that's how it works. So constant learning, then you know, upskilling, cross-skilling. I mean, these are all you know terms that we talk about, right? What is upskilling? Upskilling is about you know elevating your skills, right? So you are you are, you are a good programmer, you become a better programmer, you become the best programmer, right? So you move upwards, right? In that sense, cross-skilling is about you know, you learn other jobs, right? You're a good programmer, but you can now become a good architect, right? You could become a good uh, uh, product manager, right? You could become a good uh, quality assurance person, cyber security person, etc. Right? So, so now you now you learn things horizontally, right? So you grow vertically and horizontally, right? Uh, you know, we used to talk about different types of uh, skill growth, right? We talk about key skills, which is you know you grow very broad, but then you go deep in one skill. Uh, so a lot of these ways of uh, learning is very important. Uh, when you get into the company. Getting into a company is just the beginning of your education. It is really not the end of your education. That's true, sir. Thank you. So, and uh, for the audience, so as you know, we know that, sir, you are the C CIO for the Nissan Motors, or, or Nissan Motors, and before that, you worked for the Vodafone India and uh, for GE also. And in 2020, you had retired from uh, Nissan Motors, and you are one of the uh, selected Indian CIO for the globally uh, leadership and uh, responsibilities person. And so, from your point, uh, you would like to know after you come out or return from the design motors, what was your engagement? You know? Yeah, so uh, um, I left Nissan uh, just um, around the time that COVID was becoming mm -hmm. uh, really. Serious around the world, lockdown was starting. Uh, so at that point of time, we decided that uh, we are going to settle back in India, not in other part of the world. Uh, actually, Kerala, place that we all love. So, so the point was, how do we keep a base here, but then I can still operate the globally without having to relocate. Uh, so that's why I uh, you know, started working with the DCG and this Boston one of the uh, top uh, management consulting uh, companies in, in the world, for example, etc. That's when the Signify, which is the uh, spin off from Philips, uh, Light, uh, Philips, uh, Roy Philips, but uh, focused on the Philips Lighting part of the business, approached the companies based in the Netherlands. So that's where my office is, Amsterdam is where my office is. I have a large team in Amsterdam and uh, surrounding areas in the Netherlands, uh, in the US, uh, as well as in Bangalore and India. Then, uh, of course, smaller teams across the globe. So, that's what I do right now. So, what we call the company. Uh, but I do spend time in all these different locations. Uh, still, I also try to spend some time here uh, in Kerala with my family as well. So, that's all. That's was really nice. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it.